If you would, open your Bibles uh, to the book of the Psalms, uh, Psalm 32. Uh, we'll be reading so- the entirety of Psalm 32 in just uh, a moment. And so if you want to open there as we uh, continue today uh, this uh, journey, we're calling uh, Route 66, and we uh, pause again for the book of the Psalms. How is it that you can understand a people, a people group, uh, a a culture, a subculture, uh, whether uh, an ancient people group or a contemporary people group? One thing that I would uh, suggest as a way of gaining insight as to that which they value, that which they consider to be a virtue, that which they consider uh, to be uh, a vice, that which they hate, that which they love, that which they honor, again, that which they seek to destroy, and on it goes. One way of gaining insight is to look at their art or maybe more specifically, listen to their music. Now, again, it's a bit of a cliche here that I often quote music from the 60s and 70s. Why do I do that? Because it gives a certain type of insight as to what the people of that generation were thinking, what they were feeling, what they valued, what they hated, All of these things are reflected in that music. Another way of saying it, for the most part, it is a statement, and it's usually a very clear statement, of a godless worldview that stands in contrast to the way that we should think, act, and feel. Their values are far different than our values as the people of God. Well, it really carries forward and backward that we can look at the music of ancient Israel, the music of the Bible, the the hymn book of the Old Covenant people of God. As they express themselves, as they uh, express their understanding of their unique place in the economy, in the affections of God, life, both as a unique people of God living under this old covenant and life in a fallen world. We see them testify to that which they hold dear and that which they would seek to destroy. They they cry out in their pain and they rejoice in the goodness of their God. And so the Psalms gives us really incredible insight to the people of God. Now, please understand, as I will often say, the Psalms are just as much inspired, inerrant, and infallible. But yet, the personalities and the experiences of the people that wrote the Psalms comes out as well. And so again, it is very much the expressions of the people of God. And at some level, In some way, our human experience, our our human frustrations, and our human joys haven't changed a whole lot in the 3,000 years since God inspired these sacred writers. So let's look this morning. We're going to look at one particular psalm. I think probably I can say that it is my favorite psalm. Uh, I find it incredibly instructional and pastoral. So we're going to look at Psalm 32 uh, after we do a bit of introductory and survey work in in terms of the entirety of the Psalter. We're told uh, at the top of verse 1, it says, a mascal of David. Now, I think most commentators will tell you, That is an editorial edition. It's not really, I think it's reliable, but it's not really uh, an inspired part of the text. So, beginning in verse 1 of Psalm 
32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. For I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at all times when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Pray with me, if you will. Father, once again, we thank you for your word. Your word is sacred, it is holy, it is inspired, it is infallible. It is your word to us that we might first know you, and then by way of of extension and application, we might know ourselves. That we would know the greatness of your grace, the greatness of your salvation. God, I pray that the very same Spirit that gave us every word of this, our Bible, that same Spirit would so work into us today, that we would know uh, the great dimensions of your great love for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to go back to Psalm 1, and we'll begin a very quick uh, run through just to help you get a bit of an overview. I think it would be quite easy to be intimidated by the psalm as the longest book in the Bible, 150 uh, chapters long. And it is the Old Covenant hymn book. It, it, it served uh, both a, an instructional purpose, but it served a, a liturgical purpose in the life of Israel as they gathered to worship their God. Uh, there would have been little, probably nothing, of anyone owning a copy of the Word of God in ancient Israel. Uh, the scrolls would have been found uh, there in the tabernacle or, or the temple. And so that which was personalized of the Psalms, and maybe that's why most likely they were set to music, is so that the Word of God could be internalized by way of memorization. And so uh, uh, probably its first and foremost function was for the corporate gathering. But again, what is the purpose of the corporate gathering? So that we may each and every one of us be transformed by our encounter with the Word of God and the God of His Word. And so uh, we find that the Psalms, and I don't think many people would note this, uh, you, you might have caught it, but at least editors and going back into the uh, ancient copies of the Word of God have divided uh, the book of Psalms into five divisions. And I'm not even really going to attempt to... Uh, distinguish them by way of theme or content, but if you happen to turn through your Bible, you'll find that chapters 1 through 41 constitute book 1 and goes all the way through the fifth book, that is 107 uh, to 150, which is the final, the fifth book of the Psalms. One of the really fascinating things about the Psalms 
is they were written over about a thousand years. One psalm, uh, Psalm 90, is attributed to Moses, which would have placed the writing of the psalm somewhere around 1446 B.C., okay, 1400 years before Jesus was born. And the final psalms were written, written after the exile, even likely in that restoration period that we have talked about with Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah. And so you've got about a thousand years uh, time frame in which the Psalms uh, were written. David being the most prolific of the authors, writing 73 of the Psalms that we have. And then Asaph writing 12. Solomon is credited with two. I mentioned Moses, Ethan, and there are others uh, that wrote uh, the Psalms and they're preserved for us. Uh, the Psalms are poetry. Uh, they are they are hymns, they are, they are songs, and so the Psalms employ various devices that make them unique and memorable and understandable. The most obvious one when I read the Psalm is what's called parallelism. It'll say one thing in a line and come back and repeat itself in the next line, or sometimes it'll alternate uh, this parallelism. And so, again, for the sake of emphasis about that particular truth. Of course, uh, uh, many of you know that uh, Psalm 119, the great ode to the Word of God, is an acrostic psalm. Each stanza begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But again, the psalms particularly, and I, you definitely do not want me to attempt to read any of the psalms in Hebrew. Uh, the, the, the southern accent and the Hebrew language do not in any shape, form, or fashion agree, okay? And so, but, but there's all kinds of, of rhythms and sounds and rhymes uh, that were useful. I've already said uh, that there are uh, hymns uh, that are a part of uh, the Psalms, uh, a hymn such as what begins in Psalm 8, 1. Uh, o Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. A, a, a statement, a confession of the devotion uh, to God and, and a, a proclamation of his uh, greatness. Uh, there are uh, Psalms of lament. Turn to Psalm 137 just real quickly. And just so you know that I know, that I have preached Psalm 32 before. Uh, I couldn't have found the original outline if I'd have wanted to find it, so I don't go back and uh, reheat old sermons. But I do know that I, I believe I preached it for a Thanksgiving service uh, a number of years back, as I did Psalm 137. Uh, and again, thematically, on that particular day, how do we give thanks as strangers living in a strange land? Okay, And so you find, and I, the reason I want you to turn here is first to show you a, a lament, but also because it connects with the things we've been talking about from the history of Israel. When was Psalm 137 written? It was written after the fall of Jerusalem in 586, while the Jews were in that time frame known as the Babylonian captivity. And they were lamenting the terrible conditions and the terrible reality of the fact that they had been separated from the land that God gave them, separated from the temple. In fact, the temple was in ruins. And again, I think underlying it is the recognition that they got what they deserved, that God was just, but how they longed uh, to uh, return. And so you see in verse 4, this great cry, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Now, there's really a reality that Christians can express that question. As I've said, this world is not our home, okay? But there is an answer to that question. That is, is the story of the Christian life simply one long lament of life in a sin-cursed world? And the answer is no. 
that we sing the songs of the Lord in view of the promise and the power and the person of the gospel. Okay? Our focus is not, our obsession is not, we are not paralyzed by the fallenness of this world. This world will ultimately pass away. All of the nonsense, all of the stuff that made me want to scream this week and made me want to scream for the last 50 years will pass away. And the Lord will rule and reign triumphant. And He will preserve His people through it all. Now, one thing that challenges the reader of Psalm 137 is at the conclusion, and it, it, it's um, what's called an imprecatory prayer. It is a prayer that a curse or that God's condemnation, God's punishment, would fall on his enemies and their enemies. Notice verse 9. Blessed shall be he who takes your little ones. Speaking of the enemies of God, the Edomites specifically named there, but also the Babylonians, and dashes them against the rock. I mean, that is, that is really hard for a modern-day Christian to get their mind uh, around. But it's a statement of the just judgment of God upon those who are his enemies, who oppose him. Now, here's kind of a, a way of kind of working through this. God's people have always been delivered both through judgment and by judgment. How was the exodus accomplished? By drowning the enemies of God in the Red Sea, okay? And that theme pervades Scripture. I've mentioned several times we read a book years ago by James Hamilton, uh, Salvation Through Judgment, okay? And so how was your deliverance? How was your exodus? How was your redemption purchased? It was by the greatest judgment of all, the judgment for your sin and my sin being poured out on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So we don't pray for our enemies to have their babies destroyed, but we recognize that there will be a judgment upon the enemies of God. And all of the enemies of God will suffer the judgment of God in one of two ways. They will suffer it in their own person in hell forever or they will have it suffered for them through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel is that judgment that I deserved was poured out on Jesus Christ. And so in a very real way, as, as crazy as it sounds, that anticipates the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see hymns, we see uh, laments in which uh, the greatness of God is uh, confessed. We'll be looking in a moment at an instructional psalm. Very quickly, I'm going to turn to Psalm 127. We've read it often here. But here we find a word of admonition, a word of instruction, where the psalmist wrote this, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And I think probably in both ancient and modern, but the idea of the temple being built was only something that could be accomplished by uh, the grace and through the power and the mercy of God. But we often apply it to what? To a home, to, to a family. And, and, and whether it's a, a, a physical house or whether it's the metaphorical house in, in which we think of the members of that household, the family, you can do... All you want to do, and, and there's a sense where you should do everything you can do, but if your house succeeds, it is because of the grace and the mercy and the power of God. It won't be because you built it so well. Okay? And I think you ought to try to build it well. Don't get me wrong. But unless God is in it, building with you, building through you, it is a house built on the shifting sands of this world. And when the storms come, it will indeed collapse. There's also within the Psalms, royal Psalms, Psalms 1 and 2 seem to be associated with the coronation of the king. And they're very, very interesting. And they, they tend to be uh, prophetic. But the most noted of these prophetic, and they are messianic Psalms, uh, I have found Psalm 1610. 
It is the psalm that Peter appealed to at Pentecost when he quoted Psalm 1610 in proof of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the psalmist writing hundreds of years before the time of Jesus wrote this, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Now who's the only man that's ever lived in the course of human history whose body didn't decompose? And how did it not decompose? It's our Lord Jesus because he was raised from the dead. His body did not see corruption. Fulfillment of that prophecy. And then in Psalm 22, uh, 1, we see Jesus quoting this psalm in Aramaic. It comes, in, it comes forward in our translations in Matthew 27, 46. Eli, Eli, lemma sabachnathani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, usually we stop there and we go off on, you know, Jesus receiving the wrath of God and on and on and on. But there's more there. Who is it? Lee Corso. Not so fast. Not so fast. Because the psalm actually continues. And I believe Jesus, yes, indeed, he was quoting it for that, that purpose we mentioned. But it was not a psalm of defeat. It was not a confession of his defeat. It was a confession of his victory. Because the psalmist goes on to say at the conclusion of that psalm, and who was Jesus saying this to? To the crowd at the cross who knew the Psalms, who knew where this went. And so the end of the Psalm is this, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Jesus is the one in Psalm 2 who shall rule with the rod and iron. He's hanging on the cross. But I think embedded in that mes message is this is the means through which I will rule and reign. And I will conquer this death that, you're, that you've sentenced me to. Um, Psalm, Psalm 132.11 The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back one of the sons of your body I will sit on your throne. How much time have we spent in the last four or five months emphasizing that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the promise made to David? A promise that goes all the way back to what? The serpent shall be destroyed by the seed of the woman who will ultimately be the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, the seed of the woman. Okay? So... We see those prophetic messianic psalms embedded throughout the book. A final thing, and this kind of, that, that last section, section 5, uh, there, a lot of those are psalms of ascent. Okay, and you'll recognize the psalm. But again, this is what the uh, uh, pilgrims would have said as they were coming into Jerusalem, seeing the temple up on the mountain, as they were he headed there for the celebration of the various festivals that uh, God had given to them in the Old Covenant. The, they would have sang, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and earth. As their eyes began to be filled with that, that magnificent temple sitting up on a hill, they knew it represented the very presence of God and the statement of his faithfulness to that, his people. And so that's kind of a, a, a thumbnail sketch of the Psalms. Let's get in now to Psalm 32. If you'll remember last week, I made uh, the comment that I'm always very aware that when I step into the pulpit, when I step into a classroom, whatever I'm doing, that I'm doing pastoral care. That I'm, I'm trying to prepare you uh, for the adversities of life. The primary adversity of our life is sin. Or to say it another way, my goal for each of you is that you live with the fullest of joy. Now, I know that surprises you because y'all think I'm this ogre that comes up here every week just to beat you up and make you feel bad. But I beat you up to make you feel bad for a particular reason, okay? 
And so there's an end result. I'm, I'm like the football coach making you run wind sprints uh, after practice. I want you to be better. Better in that you know the greatness of the joy of the gospel. The greatness of the joy of your salvation. Do you know what your primary hindrance to the experience of joy is? It's not your wife. It's not your husband. It's not your job. It's not your lack of money. It's, it's not even your, your lack of health. It's not even your pastor, okay? The primary obstacle to your experience, now I'm using that word very intentionally, to, to you feeling really, really good is your sin. That's the biggest obstacle that you have to knowing the highest of the highs of the joy of your salvation. St sin is a thief of your joy, okay? And so I want you to look at this because this is an instructional psalm as the, to the realities of what happens, particularly in terms of the believer. I realize this was written under the Old Covenant, but I think the principles are the same. That is, that how may you live with freedom from anxiety and fear, and how may you live with the greatest of joy? It is this psalm, and I think this psalm can be buttressed and supported by passages throughout the Old and New Testament. This is why you'll sometimes hear me say something along this line. I do not believe that there's any such thing as a happy, sinning Christian. Okay? That's an oxymoron. That's a paradox. That, that is that God does not allow those that are truly His to perpetually persist in sin. Somebody say it, and I won't say it, okay? Y'all yeah, know. I get it. We all sin. Got it? Everybody? I know it. I do. But again, I'm talking about the distinction between a lifestyle, a persistent attitude of rebellion against God. And sometimes it's not even so much activities and actions as our thoughts and our attitudes, right? Y'all look at me, smile, nod your head, okay? We're in agreement. We're, listen, you're probably not going to catch me doing something really, really terrible for the most part, okay? Oh, me. But if you knew what my attitude was some days, if you knew what my thoughts were some day, you'd fire me. Now, you've heard me go down that line before. If I knew what yours were, I'd run you out of the church, Okay? So, we're, we're good. We're, we're matched up. Okay? But what do we do and what are the consequences if we don't deal with sin in a gospel-saturated and a gospel-informed way? Psalm 1. I mean, the, uh, the ver verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Blessed. How many of you, just raise your hand if you would just say, I would like to know blessedness. I really would. I, I would like to know. Don't be, okay, so, okay, everybody would like to be under a curse. Raise your hand, please. <laughs> Wake up. Now, let me do this again. One more time. Everybody that would like to be in a state of blessedness, raise your hand. That's good. That's real good. Okay. Notice it say, doesn't say, blessed are those who are innocent. Would anybody like to try to make the case that I'm innocent, that you, that you are innocent? Would any like, but you can have the microphone. Would anybody like to try to build the case that I have no guilt, that, 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 that I'm sinless? No, that's not what he says. Blessed is the one whose transgression, whose sin is forgiven. And here's the thing. 
in forgiveness, there is the imputing of righteousness. And being righteous is better than being innocent. Do you, know, do you realize that? that? That it is a higher state to be righteous than to be innocent. Innocent is just to be not guilty. Righteous is to be positively righteous. And that is what is ours in the gospel, okay? Now, there is a sense, please get this, that your state or your status was secured at the cross of Calvary. That your identity is of that whose sins are forgiven, okay? We do not teach that salvation can be lost and regained and back and forth and back and forth. We do not believe that. I do not teach that. But remember what I said, I'm talking about the experience, okay? That you can be a, have the state or the status or the identity, the reality can be that you have peace with God, but you don't have peace the peace of God, that you can be justified by grace uh, through faith and there's no condemnation, but you can feel like you're, it would split hell wide open. Or maybe that you're there already. You follow what I'm saying? Now, those that know Jesus Christ, you're blessed. That, that, that's your state, that's your identity, that's your status. But you can forfeit the experience of that blessing. And so, the blessed one is the one who knows, and, and the Hebrew there, transgression, is the word pasha, going away, rebellion, departure, it's the idea of just willfully. Now, those of you that are parents, I know none of you, none of us, have ever had the opportunity where you tell your child what to do or what not to do, and they immediately go do what? I see a young lady smiling back there. She acts like she knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's the idea that indeed we know what is right, what is true, what God's will is, and we rebel against it. And yet, it is a blessed state to have that sin forgiven. And that is the Hebrew Nassai, which is the idea of lifting a burden. I've told you many times, one of my favorite Psalms, I mean, one of my favorite verses is, come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Now, here's the thing. I'm preaching what I know to be true doctrinally. But tragically for me, I know what it is to feel the burden of the guilt of my sin as a believer. Okay? I know what it is to, to feel that I'm going to try to slip one by. Okay? I know what it is to say, well, I don't think that's that bad. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for a season. And it'll suck the ever-loving life out of you. Try it. No, I don't try it. But take it from one who has. Okay? I don't say that to brag. I don't, and that's not, I'm not saying that's something in, in recent experience. I'm just telling you. It's true biblically and it's true experientially. So, the blessed state is the one who knows that even his intentional sins, the burden of guilt has been lifted. That, now, notice the, the, uh, uh, the parallel, one whose transgression is forgiven, and then the next little line there, whose sin is covered. Okay, And that sin is kata, that famous falling short, missing the mark. That's kind of the idea we tried, but we couldn't do it. Okay? All right? That, that we've attempted, but we just didn't make it all the way uh, to the finish line. But that sin has been covered. The Hebrew is kasai. And again, it, I think it's reflective of the blood of the sacrificial animal being spread on the mercy seat. And that blood covers our transgression, our sin against God as defined by the law of God. So our our sin or our guilt is lifted, our sin is covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord doesn't count our iniquity against us. He doesn't go look at the, 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 the great credit and balance book, the ledger in heaven, and look and see how many check marks are in your sin column. And all of you can jump up and shout and dance and run around the room a little bit if you want to for that one. 
okay? That, 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 that he is not keeping that record. It is not counted against our, our, and again, the word our iniquity, a wob, crooked, twistedness, our perversity. It is not credited to our account. And so it is a blessed state. Notice the threefold. Our transgression is forgiven. Our sin is covered. The Lord does not count our sin against us. And in whose spirit is no deceit. In whom the Spirit of God has so worked that we can be honest with God about these matters. And again, we, we understand Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 7.10, Godly grief produces repentance uh, that, uh, 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 excuse me, Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Everybody's upset when they get caught. Everybody's upset when they mess their lives up. Everybody's upset when everybody's mad at them. There's a great difference between remorse there's a great difference between being sad I got caught. There's a great difference between I've, I've wrecked my health by abusing it with this, that, and the other and being repentant. And so again, it is repentant that does not try to play games. It doesn't try to be deceitful. That is truly a work of a holy God in our life. Verse 3. Four. When I kept silent, that doesn't mean I'm going to go around bragging about my sin. That means I kept silent before God. I refused to agree with God. I, I refused to verbalize. I refused to go to the God who knows everything. He knows, he knows you inside out. He knows why you did it, and He knows why you didn't do it. Okay? He knows why you're not going to do it tomorrow. And the good news is He still loves you. Right? Right? Okay? And so, I kept silent. My bones wasted away. Psalm 32 probably was written after the more well-known psalm of repentance, Psalm 51. But in Psalm 51.8, David also wrote, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Now, I've, I've broken two bones in my life, and it is a miserable experience. It hurts. It, it hurts, and it hurts for a long time. It hurts so bad it makes you nauseated when, when you do it. I mean, it, they're, they're awful if you do a really good break, okay? You know, I mean, you can't, you can't mess around, just do a little chip, a little crack. I mean, you got to do something that, that, that really shakes you up to make it count, okay? It doesn't count as a broken, broken bone if it's not. But what is he saying? When I kept silent, my bones literally ached. That I, that I hurt so much, all I could do was groan. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't get up. That your hand was heavy. His hand, his hand, his presence of the Holy Spirit was so oppressive and so heavy and so weighty and so defining and so convicting that you found it hard to live and breathe and to do the things that you needed to do. I, I'm reminded of the hard work that, that I used to do in the summer on construction jobs, and I can, I can remember you know, carrying blocks around foundations and three or four o'clock in the afternoon, 100 degrees, and carrying blocks, one in each hand, and literally could not stand up straight, could, could not hardly put one foot in front of the other because of the heat and the exhaustion. And that's what refusing to repent, keeping silence, refusing to go to God and say, God, you're absolutely correct. I have blown it. And I want to confess my sins because your gospel says you're faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now, there's a lot I could say about that. That's a status, okay? You are cleansed in a sense. Because when you believe, you're cleansed from, from now to evermore, okay? But if you're going to enjoy it, if you're going to experience the joy of salvation, you've got to stay fessed up, Okay? The old preacher Saul went like this. 
how should you confess your sin? Just like you committed them, one at a time. Okay? Yeah, now that, for most of us, that we don't have that kind of time. So, so <laughs> I see some heads nodding. But, yeah. But again, we need to be serious about it. And, and it, I think embedded in confession is always repentance. There is no confession without repentance. There is no repentance without confession, okay? That, that turning, that forsaking of our, our sin. But our, our strength is literally dried up. The, the, the heaviness of, of God that you literally... Lit why are there no happy sinning Christians? Why can I say that? Why am I concerned? Well, preacher, I don't think I need to come to church. I'm just da 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 da. Well, I know she's not my wife, but you know we understand each other, and God gets us, and we're real happy here. Why do I say? And but yet, if I'm going to heaven, I'm a Christian, and they all happy, clappy, and smiley. Now they, they can lie about it. You know, you never know how miserable somebody really is. Or my Bible says that those who willfully, continually sin, God will make their life so miserable that they will find it's not worth living. Okay? Yeah. And so that's my concern. When somebody just seems perfectly fine, and yet they're living in this perpetual pattern, and yet they want to say, oh, well, I know I'm saved. I got problems with it. I'm not God, and I don't get to judge him. You know, that's a good thing for everybody concerned. But beware. Beware. Experientially and biblically, I believe that's impossible. All right. So, let's move forward. Verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I didn't make excuses. Okay? I didn't try to cover it up. Well, well God, if, if so-and-so hadn't have done that, you know, I, I just had to get back at them. No, I don't want to forgive them. You don't realize how badly they hurt me. On and on it goes, right? We've all got our excuses. I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave. You forgave. Now, again, the moment you're saved, it is really true. Your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. Okay? That, that's a status. That's a state. I want, did everybody hear me say that? The moment you're saved, the sins you have committed and even the sins you will commit, if God were going to hold them against, against you, you'd have to go to hell. That's why Arminianism is so dumb. Unbiblical. Okay. Sorry about that. I hope. Edit that out. I didn't say Armenians were dumb, okay? I didn't say that, okay? Please, let's be clear. We need clarity, okay? No. But indeed, there's a status. Peace with God. No condemnation. Justified, okay? We are, we, we, we have a, we're in a state of grace. But if you would enjoy that status, that identity, that privilege, there are things that must be realities in your life. And that is you have to agree with God. You have to confess your sin before God. Because if you don't, if you choose to persist in your rebellion, He will make your life miserable. Let me tell you something. You can tell it. Listen, keep this in there. You go tell anybody you want to tell them that your preacher said Sunday that if you're happy about your condition, your perpetual sin. I didn't say lapse. I didn't say things that, okay? If you're happy about it and you're content and you have no desire to repent, no desire to change, you need to very seriously question. It is highly doubtful that you've ever come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's highly doubtful that you have ever been born again, okay? I'm not, that's not absolute. I don't know for sure, but buddy boy, buddy lady, there's a problem. There's a problem there, Houston. Okay. All right. Let's wrap it up here. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer a prayer to you at the time when you may be found. 
we have this great opportunity. We have God, we have our Lord Jesus, who is our high priest, who intercedes for us, and we can go to him. We are protected by God. Notice here in verse 8 there, this, this great statement that God says to David, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Okay, That, that, that God has taken note, and David's resolve in Psalm 51 is he is going to teach sinners your ways, your truth, so that they would come to a saving knowledge of this God who forgives. Now, y'all think I'm rough and bad and mean and all these kinds of things, and maybe I am. But Notice verse 9. Now, and I, I'd love to paraphrase that for just, but I won't. I'll just leave it to your own imagination. But don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. I mean, really, don't, don't be like an animal without understanding of these realities. That, that, that you're like an animal that will not stay under the protectorate of his master. It's foolishness. So, many are the sorrows of the wicked. But, what's our word? Steadfast love? Hebrew? Kessid. Kessid. God's covenantal, faithful, unending love for His people. That love will surround those who go to Him. Because of this truth, what can I say to you? This is my desire for you. Verse 11, look at it. Don't miss it. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, you all upright of heart. That's good stuff. That's what I desire. And that is Psalm 32. And that's its pastoral application. Well, final thing, and we'll finish. The Psalms and the Christian. Just like every other word of God, every other part of the word of God is written for our benefit. We, we are foolish to neglect the wisdom of the wisdom literature, the wisdom of the psalm. That Indeed, they help us devotionally to, to how do I express to God the realities of his greatness when he knows how great he is. Go to the Psalms. You will find the language to confess the greatness of God. You find these statements that, that give us great certainty that our sin is forgiven. It admonishes us to be diligent in the matter of confess sin, if you would know the joy of our salvation. And I believe it instructs us, and this, this is a good one, because I think it's hard work. But the discipline of the celebration of the grace of God. What, what do I desire? What do I believe is God's will for your life? To live in the discipline of the perpetual celebration of the good news that your sins are forgiven. And that, I mean, y'all can actually leave her smiling today. I don't care. Yeah, I'm going to let you. Y'all leave her smiling. That, that's the goal. That is the purpose of the Word. I, I think I can say from Genesis to Revelation, that's the purpose of the Word of God, that you re rejoice in the goodness of God as applied to you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for your truth. This is your word given for our good, given, uh, given to us that we would know something of your glory. Yes, indeed, that we would know something of life in a fallen world, know something of the great realities of our own depravity. And then we see those things, but then we turn and we recognize the magnitude and the absolutely marvelous nature of your grace revealed to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we live every day being glad and rejoicing in the goodness of our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.